Good creative mornings, everyone. I think we're already winning. If I can get you to not talk to each other, I think we've done our job already. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Tina Roth Eisenberg. I'm the founder of Creative Mornings and the New York City chapter host. And I'm welcoming you today from the ancestral land from the Lenape people. Um, and we want to recognize the significance of Brooklyn and New York City for Lenape people past and present. I want to say a really big hello to all of those of you tuning in from your living rooms. Um, or your bed uh, on the live stream. We're so happy you're here virtually, and I ask you to please keep Brian, our uh, live stream chat host, uh, busy. Um, good morning to everyone here in, in, in this beautiful space at the be beautiful Asia Society on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I want to extend a, a big thank you to my dear friend and former speaker, Jake Barton, who, who introduced me to uh, the team at Asia Society, and they have moved a mountain to make this event happen today. Uh, by raise of arms, who, who's here for the first time in this beautiful space? Oh my god, so many of you, that's so cool. Me too. Uh, Asia Society aims to bring uh, together leading thinkers on policy, arts, culture, business, and education. I highly recommend you check out their site. There's so much to discover. And if you look at their events calendar, you, you can see a range of events, um, lectures, dis discussions, analysis, reports, exhibitions, performances, networking, and family events. And climate change takes currently center stage with the Immersion exhibition uh, currently happening um, in the floors above called Coal and Ice. It brings together uh, the work of over 30 photographers and artists from around the world. And it demonstrates uh, an, uh, the environmental and human cost of climate change, but also while sharing solutions uh, for a more sustainable future. Definitely something we need. Uh, if you don't have to rush anywhere after the event, uh, please know that the Asia Society team very, very generously offered to open the mu museum an hour early so that all of you can go and um, uh, check out the exhibition. And if you... <laughs> And if you intend to see the exhibition, please just stay put in here. Everyone else that has to go, we're going to say bye-bye to you at the end. But if you want to go to see the exhibition, just stay in here. And uh, we'll, we'll coordinate the, the, the going upstairs. OK, thank you, Asia Society. You're wonderful. And thank you, thank you, thank you for so generously hosting us today. All right, so for the regulars amongst you, you know that every event, uh, we have a member of our community read the manifesto. And to shine a light on the values of Creative Mornings and to remind us why we do the things we do every month. This month, we have someone extra special join us on stage. <laughs> Our March Manifesto reader is no other than Ambassador Nick Yeager, Consul General of Switzerland in New York. And you're probably going, wait, what, huh? Uh, well, I'm Swiss. And, uh, <laughs> And Nick and I got to rub arms at an event last week, and I just thought, YOLO, I'm just going to ask him. <laughs> and here we are. Uh, Ambassador Yeager is here with his wife, Gabriela Yeager, who is the co-founder and program director of Global Changemakers, a remarkable youth organization. And it's such a pleasure to both of you here today. And Nick, would you please do us the favor? Thank you, Tina. Good morning, New York. Good morning, everyone. Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action, honesty and hard work. We are here to support you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. We believe in face-to-face -face connections learning from others, in hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. Thank you. The 30-second pitch wheel. 
Um, for those of you that don't know, every month four people get the chance to get the mic for 30 seconds and you can pitch anything you want. Love, work, a cause you care about, it all works. So we already pulled the names out to save some time. So if I call your name, uh, please be prepared to after Benjamin's talk to come up front and do your 30 second pitch. Um, Joe Rojas, um, Craig Waxman, Whitney Chu, and Ella Eisenberg. Can I see a raise of arms if you heard your name? I think I see four. I'm not sure. Let's hope so. Anyway, who here attended last month's event? Some of you. Okay. Did you hear my audible gasp when during Stand Up If I asked a question, have you ever made a friend at Creative Mornings? Because I, what I saw was this. This was a real moment for me. I'm choking up. Uh, while I had a hunch people would make friends at Creative Mornings, I didn't realize that so many would walk away feeling a bit less lonely. I have stared at this photo many times ever since. And just for context, I started Creative Mornings in, nine, uh, in 2008, uh, about nine years after I arrived in New York, and didn't know a soul, and just wondered, where are my people? And 15 years later, with the help of thousands of volunteers and my amazing, amazing HQ team, we made it happen. We created a friendship engine. So let's play Stand Up If again. So I'm going to project a few sentences to the screen. And if that sentence applies to you and you're able to stand up, please stand up. Otherwise, raise your arm. Stand up if you have attended a Creative Mornings event somewhere in another city than New York City. Wow. OK, can you just shout out a bit where that is? Dallas? Damn. OK. <laughs> Who thinks they win with the furthest away? Sydney so far. I guess I'm not good at geography, but I'm impressed. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, stand up if you're proud of yourself for getting up early and socializing at 8.30 a.m. <laughs> I'm so proud of you all. Stand up or stay standing if you're excited to visit the Cola Nice exhibition after good. I just want to get, oh my god, so many. Ooh, that's a lot. Great. Um, stand up if you aspire to be a person who gives back to your community. Stand up if you look around the room and think, I wish there was a way to spend more time with these people. <laughs> All right. Stand up if you belong to a club. Sports, running, cooking, reading. Wow. A lot of you. Stand up if you release your ticket when you can no longer make it to our events. Wait, do you all know about this feature? That's so cool, because you actually really can. And it really helps us, because especially in times like where the, there's a wait list, we actually do move people off the wait list. So please be a really good citizen and release your ticket if you know you can no longer make it. And then stand up if you have thought about volunteering with us. Oh, wow, that's a lot of you. Um, <laughs> Casey was hiding there. He'd be the person to talk to. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for playing. Because if you do volunteer with us, you actually get to be part of a really wonderful group of humans. Without these fine volunteers, our events would not run as smoothly as they do. So thank you, Leah, Cece, Megan, Emily, Celestine, Ella, Lisa, Amanda, Emmeline, Angelica, Casey, Daniel, Evelyn, Exa, Brian, Sky, Josh, Meredith, Orlan, Maria, and M. And thanks to Amin, you can actually watch this talk again. Right, Amin is the best. And, um, and thanks to Nelson, you can see how good you look on, on the photos. And then the biggest shout out for this fine human, Matthew Chavez, who makes the live stream happen. Thanks to him, we have Benjamin speak today. He, thanks to him, I slept so well because he came yesterday and set this up with this incredible AV team, by the way. I, Asia Society, you, do you know what jewels you have up there? There's four people back there, plus Matthew, and I slept so good. So thank you all. Thank you, Leo, David, Ed, and Oscar for, for making this all happen today. Okay. Do you love coffee? <laughs> Me too. And thanks to our partners, we are able to make our events happen, keep them free, serve you coffee, serve you breakfast. These are companies that give a damn and believe in this community meeting up every month. So please allow me to thank them. Um, 
Big thanks to our longtime partner, Harvest. Just like us, they're a New York City-based company, and they are our favorite time tracking software. If you have to track your, track your time uh, or your expenses, they make it super easy to do so. And uh, they have managed to make something really dry, actually enjoyable. And uh, thank you, Harvest, for supporting us. And then a big giant thank you to MPB. Um, they, I had a beautiful moment in the prep call with Benjamin leading up to this event where we talked through the event and his talk. And then I said, wait, Benjamin, let me just screen share our draft events page for a second. And please, can you sign off the bio and everything? And then we can make it go live. So I screen share and then I scroll down on his bio. And then M the logo, the MPB partner logo pops up. And he goes, wait, what? MPB is your partner? I love them. And I just sat there and was like, can it get any better? <laughs> so he, he tries to use uh, buy used gear. MPB does that. You can sell your photo and video gear, or you can buy used gear. And it's just like, it was happiness. And I introduced them earlier. It's like, it's so great. Anyway, thank you, MPB. OK. Uh, fun fact, we currently have a New York City partnership available, a slot. If you are a decision, decision maker in a values aligned company, come talk to me. I would love to tell you how great we are. OK, and now, Benjamin. What an absolute honor to introduce today's speaker, Benjamin von Wong, who only moved to New York four months ago. And two people suggested I should have him as a speaker. That's pretty wild. Um, Benjamin is one of those humans who lives a remarkably courageous, creative, and intentional life. And I'm grateful that my children, Ella and Tilo, are both able to be here today and hear him speak. He's the kind of role model I want my kids to be exposed to. Benjamin's work combines fantasy and photography and has generated over 100 million views for causes like ocean plastics, electronic waste, and fashion pollution. He, fun fact, he holds a Guinness Book of Record for the largest installation made uh, of plastic straws, and he created a centerpiece at the United Nations in Nairobi when Global Plastics um, Resolution was successfully signed. His work is nothing short of impressive, as you, as you will see in a second. And fun, fun thing, this is a first, Benjamin's talk will be accompanied, accompanied by an improvisational music performance, uh, musician poet, Charlie, Charlie Levine, who is a full-time typewriter poet, and walked in with a folding chair and table earlier. This is like, this so, there's, this is all so beautiful. Okay, give a rock star round of applause for Benjamin and Charlie. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, what a crowd. <laughs> First time I'm doing this with music too, so I'm really excited. Uh, thank you, Charlie, for coming here and waking up early in the morning, being here for us. My name is Benjamin Von Wong. I'm an artist, I'm an activist, and I try to create large-scale objects of curiosity that look something like this. The reason for creating art like this is because I want people to look at it and wonder, what am I looking at? Is this real? Is this fake? Because that curiosity gives us all the opportunity to start a conversation together. I get to say, oh, this is actually a photograph. A photograph of an art installation that I built all the way in Vietnam a couple years back. And we built this art installation with the help of dozens of volunteers from the community that came together over the course of a couple weeks inside of a mall in order to build this art piece. Because each and every art installation is an opportunity to bring community together to talk about things that they care about. And those little lines that you see that make up the art installation, well, those are straws, single-use plastic straws. 168,000 of them, in fact, that we collected, cleaned, and organized over the course of nine months in order to create a Guinness World Record art installation. The work that I create, I think, serves as a complement to science. These headlines right now behind me talk about how the clothing that we wear, polyester, nylon, spandex, all releases microscopic pieces of plastic every time we do our laundry. And it's pretty terrifying. It looks something like this, where plankton eats microplastics, the fish eat the pla the the fish eat the plankton, and then we eat that fish, and it ends up right in our bodies. But this, this kind, kind of thing, thing is not, not always the most palatable. palatable. And where I think art is powerful is that you can take something that is very abstract 
design a metaphor around it and maybe make it more fun and playful. Like if our laundry is coming back to haunt us, why not create a monster crawling out of the laundry coming to haunt the next generation? Right? Isn't this more fun to talk to your kids, to your family, to your friends about when it looks like this? <laughs> um, and, you know, as a result of doing projects like this, eventually I've had large organizations reach out with these bigger complex issues like, hey, Ben, can you find a way to represent the energy consumption of Bitcoin mining? Um, and so Greenpeace reached out and I ended up, they, they were telling me stories about how old coal power plants were being reopened because of the price of Bitcoin going up and that it was worth it just to convert that energy into dollars. And I was like, oh, what if we could create an art installation around that? What if it was a giant 12 foot tall skull with coal smokestacks uh, smoking and Bitcoin laser eyes shooting out and get my, whole, get my nephew to stand in front of it? <laughs> But it's more than just creating one art installation. I think the art is really the gateway. It's about how that art can grow into so much more, where it can be used on the cover of a report, can be used in merchandise, and maybe in the best case scenario, it can get remixed, projected onto the side of buildings, and serve as a common language, grammar, and poetry for bigger movements. And so one of the questions that I get fairly often when I show my work to people is like, how did you even get here? And the answer to that question is kind of cheesy, but it is purpose. <laughs> um, purpose is actually the reason that I first quit my day job as a hard rock mining engineer. Um, I was doing photography on evenings and weekends, and I was sharing the process with people, and people were so inspired by how I was doing these larger-than-life sets that I thought, why not take a chance and pursue that passion and share that journey with the world? And I found myself doing all sorts of crazy things like going on vacation and tying my family, uh, tie, <laughs> not tying my family, <laughs> going on vacation and tying a model 30 meters underwater in a shipwreck in Bali while on vacation and sharing with people the process of bringing these uh, crazy projects to life. After doing that for a little while, I started to feel that just doing crazy creative projects wasn't quite enough and I wanted to have a purpose for all of this, all of these attention that I was getting. And I, and I thought, OK, what are some big intractable issues in the world? I started watching some documentaries. And that's where I ended up storm chasing. Chasing the across the small little roads. A storm chaser called Kevin DeLay, chasing these storms at 50 miles an hour inside of a refurbished ambulance. Um, and we're going on on these tiny little dirt roads in order to showcase how these big brewing storms can serve possibly as a metaphor for climate change while ordinary people in front of it ignored what was happening behind them. That same string of purpose eventually led me to playing around with trash, tons and tons of trash. <laughs> um, the story behind this one was that my mom had just shared a photo of a mermaid, a mermaid tail designer while I was coming to Montreal for my sister's wedding and I thought, oh, mermaids, I really want to work with them and they have problems too. Um, <laughs> when you think about where mermaids live, they live in the oceans, and this was right at the time where the Great Pacific Garbage Patch had just been discovered, and I thought, well, why not put a mermaid on a sea of 10,000 plastic bottles, since that's where um, things are going, things are happening. And, and this project, which I ended up creating with the help of the entire wedding party, because they were stuck there for my sister's wedding, <laughs> um, ended up becoming so successful, we got 36 million views on the native video alone. It, got, it, it spread out across the world and hit the front page of many different newspapers. And I was like, man, maybe there's something here. Maybe, maybe if I can, can raise, raise awareness through my art, that I can create change in the world. And fast forward five or six more years as I continue pulling on this strand of purpose, I find myself in Nairobi, Kenya. This time, uh, this time, surrounded by three tons of plastics that we had collected from the slums of Kibera. We hired hundreds of women, local women, to help clean, sort, organize, and tie all of these plastics together because I had just gotten permission to build an art installation at the United Nations at 5 p.m. on a Friday for a Sunday 8 a.m. install. <laughs> and this art installation is a four-story tall faucet, a giant plastic tap that I had envisioned and created and we somehow managed to pull this thing off 
where this art installation gets displayed in front of 1,500 delegates from 193 different countries um, where they're coming together to sign into place a global plastics treaty. And I'm here because I believe that art has the power to shift the world, or at least I think it does, and I want to put the work not in front of the everyday person, but this time around the decision makers, the policy makers. And it seems to resonate with people because at the end of the day, this ends up being the very thing that everyone uses to communicate out the plastic pollution problem, whether they're for-profits, non-profits, government officials, all coming together under the same banner to talk about how important it is for us to turn off the plastic tap. In fact, this symbol ends up being so popular that just a couple months back, the United Nations releases their plastics report, and they choose to use my art on the cover of it, which is wonderful. They didn't pay for it, but I'm stoked anyways. <laughs> but, but here's kind of the problem, right? Um, if I take a step back as an activist, the goal of the activist is to, to create art that moves the world forward, that changes something. But when I actually look at the plastic pollution problem, this blue curve behind me shows how much plastic is being produced each and every year since its inception. And you see that curve doesn't really go down. It only goes up. And in fact, it's not just a linear curve, it's an exponential one. And it just feels like despite plastics awareness being at an all-time high, plastic pollution is only just growing and increasing. And looking at this curve, I can't help but feel like, man, Despite all of the success, um, nothing that I'm doing is actually enough, right? And so even though I've tried my best, I've chased down every single possible avenue, I've poured every single extra dollar that I ever had into trying to create the biggest campaigns that have the greatest impact, I am still not feeling like I am doing enough. And so about this time last year in March, I was contemplating a career switch. I was like, man, is the work effective? Does it matter? Does it make a difference? Um, and so even though I had you know, done what everyone says, chase your purpose, pursue your passions, I felt that purpose had kind of become a little bit unsustainable. But let's pause here for a second and like switch the tone and look at this whole thing from like another angle. <laughs> because I think there's something really funny here because if you take a step back and you look at what I just said, I'm basically saying that I have failed as an artist because I have not single-handedly, through my art, managed to resolve one of the most intractable issues that humankind has been facing, da 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 Like there's something mildly egotistical and wildly crazy about that, right? Like it's kind of weird. <laughs> but somehow, you know, like despite pursuing this entire career around sustainability, trying to get people to be more sustainable, the internal narrative that I have about my own life was like, I wanted an infinite growth in my own career success. I wanted to work with bigger brands, bigger partners, have greater impact. And that question of what is enough actually never quite crossed my mind until I reached the point where I was like, wait, this is not enough. And this became the very question that I spent the last year just thinking about and trying to work through. <sighs> and so after spending, I don't know, many months of going back and forth and debating with myself, there are a couple stories that came out that I thought, a couple insights that came out that I thought would be interesting to share. The first is that there is a difference between purpose and a person. And I think it's really important that we separate these two. For the purpose part, to relieve the burden of like every each individual supposedly being there to change the world, I think like shedding a little bit of that hero's journey and saying it is one person's job to change everything, I think is really helpful. Because we live in a complex, interconnected system of people coming together, trying to do their part. And so the right question isn't how am I going to solve the entire thing, but how can I solve one part of it? What is my role in that ecosystem? And I think for me as an artist, that role is to create great art and to make sure that people within the movement know about it. That's it. Create great art, make sure people in the movement know about it. And on the person side of things, the question that I came up with that felt really important to answer is what is enough for me to thrive? Because if I, the individual, am not fulfilled, if I don't have enough to feel connected to the world, to take breaks, to have fun, to be playful, 
then my career is not sustainable and then the work cannot exist and I cannot fulfill my purpose. And of course, as you think about enoughness, it's inevitable that we all think about this. <laughs> what is enough money? What is enough money? And this was a pretty interesting one because I think there's this whole movement right now that tells us that we need to feel our feelings more. We need to be in touch with our body. Um, we need to sense when things are not right and listen to that and fix things. But I think with money, it's completely different. With money, there's feelings and reality. And reality is just a balance sheet. It's math. I know we don't all like math, but it's math. And regardless of how you feel about something, whether or not you can afford something, whether or not something is investable, whether or not um, you should, you, you know, these are all calculations that you can make very practically. There's a book that I discovered that I thought was particularly compelling. It was called It's Not About the Money by Brent Kessel. In there, he talks about the eight different financial archetypes. And I happen to be an idealist, an empire builder, and a guardian. The idealist feels that money is the source of all problems, and so it feels really guilty for any amount of wealth that they have, so I already feel like I have privilege. I feel guilty about that. Um, the empire builder wants to accumulate more resources so they can create greater projects. And I'll, I feel bad and I want more. Um, and then the guardian is, is scared of losing whatever wealth they have, regardless of how much they have. And so I feel guilty, I want more, and I feel bad, and I feel scared because I might lose it all anyways. And so you can see how that doesn't create a very healthy relationship to money and that no matter what I do, I'm kind of trapped. And so maybe it's much more healthy to feel those feelings, acknowledge them, and then say, all right, cool, let's move on. The other lesson that I learned that I think was pretty powerful was that this idea of chasing success might not necessarily be the right one. So when you're chasing success, you spend a lot of time in that chase, not actually catching and enjoying the very thing you're trying so hard to get. Because once you achieve that new award, that new title, that new fellowship, that new project, it's quickly over and you're off chasing the next thing. And so instead of chasing success, I've been thinking that perhaps it's important for us to rather nurture the conditions for success to thrive. Because then we may spend much more time enjoying that journey and enjoying the results. The little graphic that I designed back there, um, the actual analogy is like if, if, you're, if you're chasing after butterflies, you're spending your time chasing butterflies, instead, why not plant the plants that attract the butterflies instead? The marigolds, the milkweed, the sunflowers. And then you can just sit there and enjoy and allow the butterflies to come to you. And this idea of nurturing conditions is actually what has led me right here to New York City. In the last four months, uh, I've been here and it's been wonderful. I came here because I wanted to be in a place that I could find humble badasses that were making the world a better place. New York seems to be a place that values multiple forms of capital. Yes, financial capital, of course, but cultural capital, social capital, intellectual capital. It's a place where everyone is kind of a multi-hyphenate and no one really spends much time at home Netflix and chilling because they live in such tiny spaces. So they gotta get out there. They gotta meet people. <laughs> they gotta be places like this. And that is awesome because it's really my vibe. And over the last three months that I've been here, I've been building a project that is slated to go up on the High Line in like five days or so. <laughs> um, and as I said earlier, every single one of my projects is about bringing people out to collaborate and co-create together. And I've had so many people come out to help their chefs, florists, botanists, hypnotists, people who are in between jobs, people who are video videographers, all coming together out of nowhere just to help. Some of them are actually here in this audience today, showing up just to listen in. And I think it's so beautiful to watch all these people just come together to fight for something that they believe in. And there's one more thing that I, one more lesson that I think I'm trying to integrate as I move forward into the world. And I think it's particularly relevant for the fellow activists and environmentalists that are in the room. Because when we tackle issues like climate change, it's hard to find hope sometimes. I actually drew this little like dot. Sometimes hope feels like that. 
And, and, and that dot almost feels like it's shrinking because these metrics of success that we're trying to hit, these goals that we're trying to hit, we keep failing at them and the science is telling us how screwed we are all the time. And it gets really dark, it gets really heavy, and it gets really depressing. But it's up to us to find ways of integrating more balance into our lives. Tiny little yin-yang logo up there. Um, because the way you create more hope in the world is by finding hope first within yourself. I think it's important that we also take the time to pay attention to what kind of content we are consuming, what kind of people we're surrounding ourselves up with. We're the solution makers, those that are doing cool things that we want to celebrate and also put out into the world. And what that looks like in my case looks something like this. Um, I recently learned about this thing called biochar. Um, and I'm surprised that I didn't know about it earlier, but biochar is responsible for 89% of verified carbon removal credits. Um, the best way to describe biochar is like a piece of toast that you put too long in the toaster. It comes out, it doesn't really catch on fire, but it's black. It doesn't catch on fire because you're putting it in a low oxygen environment. And if carbon doesn't meet oxygen, then CO2 isn't formed. And what you end up with is a chunk of carbon that you can crumble in your hands, and toss into the soil, and it helps to rejuvenate the soil. It's great at absorbing micronutrients. It's great at preventing fertilizer runoff. It's great at retaining moisture. So it's both good for climate adaptation and climate mitigation. And it's really easy to do. And so I ended up in Thailand wanting to do something with this biochar that no one had really kind of done before. And we ended up creating this giant six meter tall phoenix where each piece of biochar ended up being a feather of the art installation. And when I look at something like this, a phoenix rising from the ashes to fight climate change, I think there's something really different about this versus the other work, which shows the magnitude of what the solution could be versus the magnitude of the problem. And so this is where I would like to move towards, to find allies in, to find friends in, to co-create with. And now as I stand here on this stage, a uh, good like one solid year since contemplating a career switch. I'm proud to say that after all this introspection and these different frameworks and questions that I've asked myself, I'm feeling better. Nothing has actually changed in my life. I'm still just an artist, trying to do its best, just pulling on that string of purpose, creating work, trying to touch people's hearts, trying to move the needle forward. But I feel better. I feel more at, in, in peace. I feel more in balance. And I feel like I have the bandwidth to keep exploring these big, important topics. And so what I'd like to leave you with today are three questions, in case you ever find yourself in the same situation as me. The first question that I think is really important to know is, what is your metric for a year well lived? I think a year is the perfect amount of time, because it's long enough for you to know whether or not you're heading, like it's long enough to set some ambitious goals, but not too short that you kind of lose your way in between. Having metrics is really important because at least you have an idea of whether or not you're walking in the right direction, right? And these can be personal, these can be professional, it doesn't really matter. The second is, do you have enough to live that life? And when I do the exercise, I feel that for most of us in general, there's only one or two things that we feel like we don't have enough of, and that becomes very simple and easy to focus on. Because now you're not trying to maximize all, your, all, the, all the metrics of abundance, but rather you're just focusing on the, the minimum that's enough for you to thrive. And the third and final one that I think is perfect for this room is who can help you get there? Because this is not a journey that we go through alone. This is one that we go on together. And I'm pretty sure that there's someone in this room that is your who that can help you get there. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful time here at Creative Mornings. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, yeah. and Charlie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> and 
And by the way, this this QR code is because I need friends. And if you want to be friends, please take a photo Benjamin, and Benjamin, you need to forward to the QR code. Oh. Yeah. Um, I need friends, so I made a QR code. Uh, looking for humble badasses. If you guys want to hang out or do something. Anyways, thank you. <laughs> oh wait, stay, 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 stay. Oh, I need to stay. I need to stay. I can't leave. Okay, how are we doing on time? Yes, we have time for Q and A. It's my favorite oh, right. thing. Oh, Q and A. I forgot. Do you want to ask questions? <laughs> I see one arm up. I have one enthusiastic person over here. Tina, I've got one over here too. No, okay. no keep first. playing. <laughs> okay, you go first, and then I'll hand out the mic. What are your answers? Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry. What are your answers to those three questions? Oh, great. Um, what is your metric for Year Well Lived for me on the personal front was to participate in four week-long immersive experiences, learning something that I don't know anything about, um, at least four in the year. Um, and then on the creative and artistic challenging front, I want to do at least four projects in a way that I hadn't managed to do before and to challenge myself. And then I have sort of more squishy qualitative metrics. It's just around friends and community. Um, but I don't, haven't like articulated exactly what that is. Um, on the second question, which is, what do I not have enough of? It was community, which is what brought me to New York City. I have friends all around the world, but as a nomad bopping around, I've just never managed to figure out community. I've been really good at building an audience, but I haven't figured out community. And that's something that I'm trying to do, and I think if I stay in one place a little longer, that might help. Um, and then the third, the who's, I guess, that's what this QR code is for, so we'll figure it out, but I think this seems like a really good place to start. So, thank you. Thank you for the amazing soundtrack. Um, and <laughs> uh, as far as you creating community, um, it seems as though you have managed to create quite a few communities in the production of your work, which I think is an amazing feat and something that creatives tend to struggle with when it comes to gathering people to help support big ideas. And I actually contributed some plastics to Thank the you. current project going up on the Highline. Thank you very much. I thought it was actually incredibly creative the way that you partnered with a sustainable fashion organization to create what I assume is going to be some large fashion-based works on the High Line, I'm guessing. Um, I have two questions around that. One, how have you managed to create those great partnerships and communities around building your work? And um, what are you gonna do with the plastic after? <laughs> And For will you sure. track that progress? Because right. that, if you said you're interested in tracking the solutions, um, yeah, maybe track what happens after your work too. For so sure. curious on both of those counts. Yeah. Um, so I think, and this is kind of a hunch, I don't really have like quantitative, like hard data to explain it, but I have a hunch that people really like to be involved in things that are really big and ambitious. And actually, the bigger and bolder and weirder the thing that you're trying to do is, the more chance you have of people actually wanting to participate in them. Um, because it just sounds weird. It sounds interesting. It's like, oh, I don't, I don't know what this person's doing. I'm just going to come participate because it sounds really cool and creative. Um, and so maybe if you're struggling to find people to partner up with you on something, maybe the question is, like, what would make you want to partner up with them? And how do you craft a story that feels you know, worth people's time? Um, on the plastic front, so the art installation that we're building on the High Line is made out entirely out of single-use plastics, and we have we're basically making a giant multi-headed, a multi-headed hydra with bathroom mirrors instead of heads, um, and and that showcases the magnitude of the problem. Uh, but then hidden inside the heart of the beast is going to be like a little keyhole, and in that keyhole is a tiny miniature refillable station. <laughs> Um, that people can kind of see how things used to be with a call to action that says don't don't rebuy just refill um, And so hopefully in one like nice Instagrammable shot You can put your phone in there and you can pull it out and you can see the problem and the solution in one shot um, And the art installation is gonna go and live uh, permanently and in New Jersey at, at a place called Carney Point Which is where all the where the fly on NY headquarters are 
so people can go and have their unsustainable helicopter tour of New York City, and then they can feel guilty about it and take some photos next to the art installation. Uh, like, that's, that's the hope. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, which one of your pieces is your favorite and which one is the most sentimental to you? Thank you. Um, so the, my current favorite project is the Phoenix one because I, I have really struggled to figure out how do you take this career of being the trash boy and, and like move that into something that's more hopeful and exciting. Um, and so the Phoenix is my current favorite that I really love. Um, the one that's most sentimental... I know. I guess. I guess there's a lot of sentimental sentimentality around like my past work, the stuff that was just a lot more light and creative, just for the sake of creative, like the one where I tied a model 30 meters underwater in shipwreck. It's like, it's still. It's so cool to be able to have these projects, but I don't know for whatever reason these days I can't bring myself to go back there now that I have this whole sort of purpose thing behind it. Um, so that feels very sentimental, but you know, a chapter in the past. One over here. Hi, uh, congratulations on the great work. Thank um, you. So when you go back to when you said you had this crisis, if you thought you were kind of doing the right thing, and I found it very surprising because for us, uh, your work is like amazing, and you're an accomplished artist. So like, if you have that crisis, like imagine like what more regular people go through and yeah like just how you um how you overcame that yeah i mean i think like, it's one thing taking like 15 years of my career and slamming it into 15 minutes and making it look pretty for you guys and it's another to like live it where you do like i'm doing like two or three large projects a year and sometimes like one falls through and it's somewhat feeling like catastrophic um the other is like i can spend years on a project or months on a project and leave there with like zero or negative dollars and just being like man was that worth it like did I put my resources in the right place and so I think that's where the feeling of crisis and not enoughness actually comes from it's just like the reality of creating art is a lot harder than just a little talk that you kind of make it all sound pretty for like it makes a lot of sense but I had to string my life together to make sense for you guys to tell you a nice story um <laughs> Um, and how I guess how I, how I got through it was um, I have friends, just a lot of conversations, a lot of introspection. I, I, took, I took some time out. Like one of the things that I've been trying to do is like work through my relationship to struggle, like shifting from ease to struggle. I actually wrote a series of guidelines on how to make decisions in my life, how to create a more sustainable life. I call it golden guidelines. You can shoot me a text and, uh, or a note and an email and I'll, I'll be happy to send that to you guys. Um, just really trying to like understand what are the, um, how I work, what, what brings me joy, what makes my life work. Like I recently remapped my core values and I realized that my core values are actually first, curiosity and adventure. So I love novelty, I love excitement, and that's really important. But the reason that I do it is because I want to have change and transformation, both internal and external. And I want to show up in a way that's kind and authentic and compassionate at the same time. So like that sort of created like a little bit of a guide, but that's also fairly recent. Like I, I, I figured it out, I worked through it. And so I just spend a lot of time trying to like understand like what is the like underlying programming code that makes this little robot tick? And then from there, how can I work through it? So just, I don't know, I just human. <laughs> Try to and on it. that note, give this man a rock star round of applause, man. Thank you. And, and Charlie. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Yay. So, from now on, from now on, I want all my talks. <laughs> My talks, our talks, I mean, you're just incredible. Should he accompany people's pitches?
For the people whose names were called before the presentation for 30 second pitches, if you would come on line up, we would love to hear from you. Woo, woo, woo! As a reminder, it's Ella Eisenberg, Whitney Chu, Craig Waxman, and Joe Rojas. Come on down. All right. So whoever's first, yep, and I'm going to be taking notes from you, so just get ready. Okay. Excellent. Xai is still here. Can you take him? Because otherwise she's on double duty. Can you take the notes? Awesome. <laughs> All right, Joe, do you want to come right on up? Hello. So, so where'd you go, Vince? Where'd you go? Where'd he go? He was awesome. So I just—it's it's an honor and a privilege to be able to come after that. All I'm, all I'm, all I'm asking for is that you download the 2030 app. If one in 16 people take actions to mitigate their own climate carbon footprint, we can avert the two degree crisis that they talk about in the UN gap report. That QR code right there will take you to an app that lets you measure your own carbon footprint and join a community of people that are committed to reducing their carbon footprint. And that's all I got. I love you. Thank you. Up next, Ella Eisenberg. Hi, I'm Ella, and here is a poem I wrote. Thank you, sorry. Thank you, poets, this feeling in my chest. Not butterflies, quite the opposite. A cloud, a loving cup of tea, my coziest blanket back home, soft and warm. Right beneath my heart grows a soft love for the art of language. Excitement for poetry, excitement for the wind, the stitches in my shirt, the rumble of the train, excitement for everything. Thank you, poets. Next up, Whitney Chu. Hi, everyone. I'm Whitney. This is my first Creative Mornings event. Um, my partner and I actually moved here to New York three days ago. Uh, <laughs> so nothing really to pitch other than we're also looking for humble badasses to hang out with. Um, and funny story, Ben, actually, you connected with my partner like over Rome research back in COVID. So I think you guys should talk. Um, but how much time do I have left? OK, cool. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you. And last up, we have Craig Waxman. Hi, everybody. Um, so I mostly work as a documentary cinematographer. But one thing I'm really excited about is working with museums to 3D scan their artifacts to preserve them and to increase access to people who can't travel to museums. So looking for friends, allies, and collaborators who might have any good ideas of items that would be cool to digitize. And if you want to see any examples, um, come find me at the thing afterwards. Wow, OK, I have to say my mommy heart is beating really hard. That was my daughter, Ella. <laughs> Oof. But all the other ones were great, too. I'm just <laughs> Charlie, will you take us home with a recap? Hello. I do, in fact, have a voice as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, can we give it up to all the presenters so far tonight one more time? That was so beautiful, everyone. Um, and I'd like to especially thank our, our distinguished speaker so much for hitting me up like a week ago, being like, hey, I know you accompany people sometime when they speak. Could you do that for me? And I was like, yes, absolutely, I can. Um, and so I figured, why do piano when I could do piano and one of my other loves, which is poetry? And so I'm going to do a little spoken word bit beat thing as um, a way to close this out. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, here we go. <clears throat> 
Not AI, it's a cry of my calling. It's a cross-nation conversation of creation. 168,000 straws from ocean jaws put to awe. Take an abstract back to form, sew it in the nightmare, sew it like the nightmare out of which it was born, but yet I'm torn. Took a moment to think, are these steps inept? Will the signal just fade as we ride on the waves into inevitable brink? Am I artistically failed as globally hailed if I carve a slice of bright in the contractably intractable all-encompassing night? Wait, wait, stop. Put a pause in the brain. I'm a person with a purpose and it's worth it to birth it. My goal isn't being told as the soul, soul in the thousand story of old. It's being the being who's listening for dreaming, who's growing up gardens till movements can see him. And yet, when I listen for the glisten of the life full of blissin, I'm always hearing the hissin' of the good old money I'm missing. But damn, it's freeing and seeing that all these feelings just feelings, accepting I'm connecting to the real, not reeling. Learning chase is a waste of your place. Better to nurture nature of conditions with the budding buds of your mission. That the butterflies flutter by till they too see the blooms worth kissing. Which might just lead to NYC, the eightish million zillion hobbied symphony of capital cultural, not so much vultural, a crit, a creative, humble, playful, fun, and badassery. Shout out to the Highline who's working with me, but also the we, the hypnotists, the florists, who are helping me see the helping of hope, to sip up the blessing of balance out from the rivers of malice, to feel my year well lived because I may just have enough because of the people and not the stuff. Thank you.